once again, we've had the opportunity to meet together. Since the last time we met, we each enjoyed a good meal, a physical meal, and I pray now that we will once again be blessed with a spiritual meal. God so longs to come back and pick up his bride. I remember just days before I was married thinking, this will never come. It'll never happen. It's still two days away. Jesus has been waiting for 2,000 years since paying the price. And today we're going to talk about the death of Laodicea, which at the same time is related with the bride of Christ. I was told by some that this morning uh, I failed to mention all three of the things that help you to hear God's voice louder and more clearly. I'm going to mention them right now. The first one was to be able to obey. Every time you hear God prompting you to do something, if you will obey, the next time it gets louder. If you don't obey, the next time it gets weaker. So therefore, every time you hear it, get used to obeying, and you will hear it more loudly the next time. The second thing that helps the voice to get louder, that God's clear leading and understanding, is that every time you roll up the windows, like in your car, to the world and say, no thank you, to some of the world's products, you know, when you go to bed after watching a movie, what's the first thing you think about when you wake up? The last song you heard, the last scene you heard, it's right there in your mind. And all of that, it's like noise. I wish I had a white noise generator here. And a white noise generator makes a noise like this. And you have a signal to noise. And you had a nice, beautiful music here. And I would hold it near the mic, and you would hear the noise, and you would hear the music. It's just like rolling the windows up in your car. When you're listening to the radio in a car, and you're going down at 60, 70 miles an hour, there's so much noise from outside, you have to roll up the windows to be able to hear the signal clearly. It's the same way in the world. There is noise everywhere. Watch it, the bulletin boards, the television, the radio, the literature. It just bombards you, noise, noise, noise. So you cannot hear the Holy Spirit's quiet promptings. And when you voluntarily take it in, you create noise for yourself. And no wonder you can't hear the signal. In order to increase the signal-to-noise ratio, reduce the noise. As you reduce the noise, the signal comes through more clearly. That's the second thing. Just voluntarily stop feeding your mind some of the things in the world. And i got to tell you clearly, as well, very bluntly, if you're voluntarily feeding yourself the world's trash, you're not getting ready for heaven. And if you're not getting ready for heaven, you're probably getting ready for hell. Because you cannot play a game and say, I think I'm, I'm getting ready for heaven, but you're feeding your mind the other. If you, if you watch soap operas every day, you cannot be saved. Sounds blunt, doesn't it? Well, say nice things like, God loves you, doesn't matter. He understands. I didn't come here to say nice things. I came say, here to say things that will help you survive the future. If you're feeding your mind voluntarily the world stuff, you cannot be saved. Because you're not getting ready to survive the future. And you cannot survive the future unless you very, have a very strong dependency relationship and obedience relationship and love relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're voluntarily committing adultery with the world through feeding yourself that trash, you cannot be ready for Jesus' second coming. It, it's, it's not about works. It's about relationship. When if, I, if I went out on the road, and when I travel all around the world, and I came back and told my wife, you have to understand, I'm a man. You see, when I'm on the road, I have to have some women in the other countries. You think she would understand? <laughs> but you, the honey, you must understand. I, I'm alone a lot. She would not understand. Why? If I'm your wife and you love me, you wouldn't do that. It's very simple. And if we love Jesus and we're getting ready for a second coming, we simply, there's some things we don't do. We do not feed our mind voluntarily the world stuff. It's already hard enough when you don't want to feed it. But if you're doing it on purpose, then you have a problem. It's important for us to realize that what we feed our minds is what we're becoming. The third thing, the very third thing that you need to do to hear God's voice more loudly, speaking to you, impressing you, guiding you, is memorizing Scripture. The more you memorize Scripture, the more easily it flashes back in your mind. You say, Lord, I'm scared. And immediately, John 14, 27, my peace I leave in with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. But Lord, I don't have enough to cover, cover the bills of the ministry. Do not worry about anything. 
but by supplication and prayer with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so every time you come to a crisis, boom, the answer comes. Where does it come from? Memorized scripture and spirit of prophecy. They're both inspired, by the way. They have different functions. Foundation for everything we believe. Fine print to prepare for the future. If you want to put them in two categories, you can, but they're not. They're both inspired by God. And it's important to know that as we prepare for the future, everything that is inspired of God was made in order, was given to us by God to prepare us for the future, to prepare us to, for heaven. So therefore, they come together. I don't, I don't consider anything that comes from God to be useless. It's very, very important. And now as we begin to study our evening, afternoon program, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer and ask God to guide our minds. Should we? I invite you to join me. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to have the freedom and the abilities and the message today which you have for us, which you are giving to us in order to prepare us, to strengthen us in our relationship with you. Everything about you is freedom. Freedom from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin, freedom from the worries of having to take, care, to take care of ourselves. And now, Lord, we want to have the freedom of living and growing in you because you've given us that gift. And today, we ask for that clear minds to understand the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Of most of the churches that I go to, this is probably one of the ones that probably hears the most messages on, on Revelation. However, there's always a different angle to things that help you to understand things better. And I'm going to share a few things that maybe you've heard and maybe it'll be a different point of view for you. How many churches are in Revelation 2 and 3? Seven churches. In which period of, of church history are we in right now? The seventh period, Laodicea. Now, the, the focus is not going to be on Laodicea today, but I have to use Laodicea as a bouncing board because the subject for this afternoon is the death of Laodicea. Do you think Laodicea, Laodicean condition is compatible with heaven? What is a Laodicean condition? Lukewarmness. Now, I was at Southern College, Southern Adventist University. In the year 2000, I was asked to speak for Alumni Weekend. And they asked me a long time before Alumni Weekend. And then two weeks before Alumni Weekend, they called me and said, David, you've been elected to be the alumnus of the year. Could you come a little earlier? There's a ceremony. Well, I was down in the jungles, and I thought, what? They're going to pick a little jungle pilot from down in Guyana to be the alumnus of the year? So I was confused. I went up there. I was very honored. I asked the, you know, I asked the administration, why did you, check, did you pick a, a jungle pilot? And the response was very interesting, because we would like our students to be like you. In other words, we want our students to be mission-driven, so we pick our heroes for people to be like. Amen. I was very proud of the university, glad that I could play a part in that vision, but very glad that when people hold up missionary heroes and say, young people, be a missionary too. Amen. Well, I was speaking, they asked me, they said, on Sabbath, you can take the church and have the older people, or you can take the gymnasium and have the young people. Which ones do you want? I said, oh, give me the young people. I said, that, that, that's my target. That's the devil's target too, by the way. Um, I want the young people. So they gave me the gymnasium, but the only problem is they didn't figure all the old people would come from to the gymnasium too. <laughs> so they had to move in about 500 new chairs, and they brought it, and everybody came. And I was kind of hoping to have some private time with the young people because I was going to preach a sermon I'd never preached before, and it was very direct. And that, it was about encouraging them to leave the church. You know, nobody ever preached that way. An Adventist preacher encouraging young people, but that's what it, that's, it was. You know how you, know how, how you have, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, when, you, when you say the opposite of what you mean? Reverse, reverse psychology, that was it. I was going to use reverse psychology with them. And by encouraging them to leave the church, I was going to try to force the opposite, <laughs> opposite reaction. So I told them a story. I told them I was sitting in, in, at the union office in Lima, Peru, and the electricity had gone out. The current division secretary 
uh, and I were standing outside. He was a youth director at that time. We were standing outside, and there's four lanes of traffic coming this way and four lanes of traffic coming this way. And, and the electricity was off. The red lights weren't working. The cars were all jammed up together, and they were tooting their horns. It was a loud racket. And, and so he mentioned, you know, you know, David, I wish they'd send a policeman here. I mean, I don't think that these cars are going to ever get out of this traffic jam without a policeman. And we waited for another five minutes, and they were still there. And then I realized there was a need. And I'm the kind of person that I always go to meet the need. I said, I told him, I'm going to be the policeman. He said, you're going to do that? Somebody has to do it. He said, I don't know if I, OK. So I walked out, and I found the one car that could move. All the other cars had somebody in front and behind. But one car had a way to turn to the right. And so I went up to that car, and it was a lady driving there. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I need you to turn right here so that the cars can get going. And she told to me, she, she turned to me and she said, I don't want to turn right. I'm going straight ahead. And I said, but you can't. There's a car ahead of you. But if you turn right, you could go around and that'll help the car behind you pretty soon. She said, I don't want to turn right. I'm staying right here. I'm not being a very good policeman. <laughs> so then I said, I suddenly began to act like a policeman. Ma'am? If you don't turn right right now, I'm going to take away your driver's license. I'll raise you and take you down to the police station. You move right now, or you're arrested. <laughs> she said, yes, sir. <laughs> Pretty soon, all eight lanes were flowing again. I came back. I said, what do you think? He said, David, you do the craziest things, but it works. <laughs> and it's all, been, it's all about getting the job done. Whatever works that is appropriate, somebody has to do the job, do the dirty work. Do it. But as long as the job gets done. And, uh, and so I've been thinking about that, and I was thinking about our young people. Today, you know, I had, I, at that time when I preached that sermon, I had four teenagers in my house. And uh, sometimes the temptation is to put one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And you want to play the game for both sides. And you like being with the world during the week, but you don't want to leave the church because your identity is in a church too. And so you keep your legs like this. And sometimes it's us, we old people, that have the problem. We put our feet like that and we say, nobody can get by me because I'm in charge here. Somebody has an idea for church? No. That's not the way we do it here. Oh. Now, we're not talking about appropriate or inappropriate things. We're talking about letting somebody else have a little initiative. And sometimes we hold on to the reins and we micromanage the churches and the young people finally get frustrated and they say, well, I guess I don't have a part in this church anyhow. I think I'll go outside and do something. And so we don't give others opportunities, especially the young generation. If we don't pull them into the mission and we don't delegate to them heavy responsibilities and tell them we're holding you accountable, but like Timothy, Paul put him in charge. Hold them accountable, but give them work to do. The way to save young people today is not to entertain them. It's to put them to work. You put them to work, they feel, they identify with the work. I have, I have very, very important position for the young people today. I mean, they're in charge of leading continents. I have a young man who's a, who's a pilot, mechanic, nurse, born in Africa, speaks Swahili, French, Kanandi, Indonesian, and English. And he's been working for me in South America as chief pilot in Guyana. And finally, he said, David, I've been learning how to conquer Guyana. I've been watching you conquer South America. But he said, I have a desire on my heart to go back and I want to conquer Africa. It is my continent and I'm taking it. Amen. And I said, I'm with you all the way. So he's moving. He bought an airplane and we already have two other airplanes that are already there. And he bought an airplane. He's preparing it. And in another couple of weeks, he'll be going to Cameroon. And he, he just barely went there, prepared a few things. And already he has a school going up. And he's already made arrangements to put French broadcasting and English broadcasting from the Caribbean on the air. He hasn't even gotten there yet. But he learned one thing. The continents are ours. We can have them. Amen. Wherever you put the sole of your foot, I have already given it to you. Right. You know, it's interesting how Jesus mixes, mixes tenses. He doesn't say, wherever someday you do put the sole of your foot, someday I will give it to you. He says, wherever you someday, future tense, put the sole of your foot, I have already given it to you. It's a done deal. Fresno is already yours. Amen. You haven't put your foot there. You haven't put your foot there yet, have you? There's people in Fresno that don't know Jesus. That's your fault, you know. God's going to hold you responsible. I want you to, you, he will. He's not going to hold me responsible in Venezuela for Fresno. That's your problem. So, 
I'm glad I don't have that responsibility. But that is, that is your problem because he put you here and you have the ability to take the whole city. It can be the biggest thing that Fresno ever heard about if you allow God to use you like that. If you think big enough. And then if you take Fresno, you can take Los Angeles. If you take Los Angeles, you got California. And if you got California, the U.S. is a cinch. Because there's this, there's this uh, Austrian governor you have. So if you, take, if you take California, you might as well take Austria while you're at it. <laughs> you see, it's unlimited. You have to understand what God is doing. It's yours. But when we stand in a way and we say, no, this is not the way we do it. We see we have our corporate culture. I learned when I was, when I was studying for my MBA, I learned that I took a class called Corporate Cultures, Institutional Behavior. Do you know how hard it is to change institutional behavior? It, there's only two things that can change the way the institution thinks. It is so hard. That's the way we think. When you think Fresno Seventh-day Adventist Church, people immediately get a vision, a, an image. And right now, of course, it's changing. Now they're thinking, oh, that's the place where they put in all those TV programs on prophecy. It didn't used to be that way. It is extremely hard to change corporate culture. And we have 150 years of Seventh-day Adventist corporate culture, and it's really hard to change. I mentioned the birth process, the maturity process, and the temptation is to institutionalize and set, settle down in cement and never move again. And if you do that, you begin to die. And many of our institutions around the world have begun dying for the last 30 years. We've been closing down. We may be baptizing a lot of people, but we're closing down in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In Europe, they just sold big, five big churches this big and sold them and closed down in one country, in one country. Uh, there's hospitals here. San Diego, just, I just heard news that that they're probably going to close down that hospital with 1,500 employees. We've been selling out hospitals all over the country, all over the world. Now, is this a criticism because something is wrong? No, it's a recognition that we have a symptom. We have a problem. Is it God's idea that we die? No. But when you go to the doctor, do you want him to tell you all nice things? Well, you, your tests don't look good, but don't worry about it. I'm sure you're just fine. Is that what you want to hear? You go, doctor, you're just being critical of me. <laughs> you don't say that. When you go to the doctor, you want to hear the truth. The truth is, for 30 years, we're, we're, we're in trouble. We are on the backside of an institutionalized church that is so hard to change. When times change, we cannot adjust to it. And right now, what is needed is a, 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 a uh, businesses that are flat, that can react to, to the needs real fast, that can delegate, that can let young people do things, and older people have wisdom and vision. The young people have energy. They work together, and, and everybody does their part. And, and those that can pull this off, they seize and win the world. And so I told the young people, I said, some of you are standing in the world, Southern Adventist University. I told them, some of you are standing, and some are here, and you don't let anybody pass. Your friends would like to commit their life to Christ, but they see you standing in the way. And some of your older people that you'd like to be involved in, they don't let you either. They're on this side blocking traffic. The whole thing is about blocking traffic. The devil has a system set up that our own culture works against us. And even if you're a good person, the older you get, the harder it is to learn new tricks. You know that. I'm not calling you a dog. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the truth, isn't it? It's harder to change the older you get. So therefore, unconsciously, good, solid men and women of God stand in a way because they've always done it this way, and there's no way to do it differently. And the young people, they learn that trick too very early. By the time they're teenagers, they know it very well. And so I said, it's time for you to make a decision. You're blocking traffic, just like in Lima, Peru. It's time for you to put everything on the line and make your decision and come in all the way and work for God. Or if not, would you please get out of the church? You're blocking traffic. There's a few of us that would like to get a job done. God would like to get the job done. And I talked about a 1% solution. The 1% solution is this. Gideon asked for volunteers, and he got 32,000. Now, I've preached this sermon in Europe, and there's only one country in Europe that I was frightened to death when I preached it because nobody knew who Gideon was. And I kept saying, how many? You know, most everybody says 300. No, no, initially. Some people say 32,000. But, but at least everybody can remember Gideon and the 300, right? This church didn't even know who Gideon was. And it just frightened me because if we don't even know the basic biblical things, how in the world can we survive the future? And so, 
But they were hungry. They wanted the message. They were thirsty. Thank the Lord for the hungry sheep. But shepherds, beware. If you're not feeding a sheep, if all you're doing is petting them, you're in trouble with a sheep shepherd. And so, the 1% solution, 32,000. And then God said, that's too many. Cowards, go home. How many were left? 10,000. And then God said, too many. Take them down to the river and drink. And of those that drunk with their hands and kept on, on the alert, they stayed. Everybody else went home. How many were left? 300. If it were 320, that would have made it easier. Exactly 1%. But it was 300, slightly less than 1%. So God said, okay, with 1%, I can win the battle. That's all I need is 1%. Just give me 1% solution. And then, as I was getting ready to preach that, my skin started to crawl. A cold sweat as I realized that that very same year, the Seventh-day Adventist Church announced it had 14 and a half million members. And 1% happens to be 144,000. You see, God doesn't need 14 and a half million members. He can do it with 1%. That's all he needs. Once he has a 1% ready, committed, we're going home. Uh, you know what that means? We have three, th maybe 300 people here, only three of us. If only three of us today go all the way with Christ and he can say, you're mine, we're going home. The sad part is for the other 99%. The other, the other, the other God doesn't want anybody to be lost, but he's not waiting for everybody to be ready because everybody will never be ready. He'll take 1%, he'll call it, the crisis will come, everybody will be divided in two groups, and the opportunity that was ours today will now pass to those who haven't heard yet. But we will not have the opportunity again. And so I decided to study about this 1% solution. I was reading about the church today, and I read about the lukewarmness. And as I read this, let's, let's read it a little bit here. Um, Revelation 3, 14. And to the church of the angel of Laodicea write these things. This thing, this, th these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. There's a lot that can be said about all of this. I'm just going to move right along and focus on the one point. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. God prefers an atheist to a Christian that says he's one, but he really isn't. Because an atheist doesn't do any harm very much to God. The worst damage that happens to God's church is when somebody says, I am a child of God, and they live like a heathen. Or worse yet, no, not a heathen. A heathen is cold. They say, I'm a child of God, and they live partially a Christian. That's the worst thing. Because they can almost, they can almost be confused with a child of God. So he said, I wish you were cold or hot. And because, he says, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, when I read that, that vomit thing, don't make me clap now. When I read the vomit thing, you know what happened? I, I, I had some flashback. Have you ever had flashbacks? I remember in South America, we had a little boy come to her in Venezuela, and he at 2 o'clock in the morning, my wife woke up. We, we heard somebody go, and vomit all over the wall. What happened to that little boy? Went out there, and I almost vomited on the spot because the whole, the whole hallway was filled with vomit. And I went in. My wife said, I'll clean it up. I said, how did you do that? She said, I held my nose. It's terrible. Do you, do you like smelling vomit? It's nauseating, isn't it? It made me remember my childhood. My dad was flying an airplane. Uh, and uh, in Bolivia, we have all these cattle people. And they call themselves, uh, you know, ganaderos. You know, that big he-man, macho. And they ride these wild bulls. And in, in Bolivia, wild bulls are called chucaro. And of course, the, these cow, cowboys, they ride these chucaros. And they, who can stay on the longest? And so my dad had one and in front of the airplane. I was sitting in the back with another one of these uh, cattle men. And my dad, so I don't know, it just occurred to him. He said, hey, you're a, you're a, a he-man, aren't you, a macho? Yeah. Do you ride chucaros? Oh, pastor, I love to ride chucaros. And my dad said, see if you can ride this one with the airplane. <laughs> now, this is quite different than riding a bull, you see. And I, I looked at his face, and he was turning green. But then I looked at the, my, the guy sitting next to me, and it was worse. He was going like this. 
You know what that meant, right? He was looking for something, and he found it in the hat of his friend. He picked the hat off the top of the, of the he grabbed the hat, <clears throat> and filled up his hat with vomit. Un unfortunately, it was made out of woven grass. And it started to drip out. My dad saw the problem, and he opened the window and said, throw it out. So he grabbed it, and he threw it out the window, and it all blew back inside. all over us. I still have trauma to this day. It's a horrible experience, this vomiting thing. And what, what makes God nauseated, and he's about to vomit, and he will vomit, is somebody who plays Christian and they're not real. Or they're half real and half not. You know, half re, half, lukewarm is partly hot, right? But it's partly cold. So there really is a little bit of hot, they really do care about the church, but they also care about the world. And that mixture is nauseating to God. And he's going to vomit. Now, let me ask you, do you think Laodicea in that condition can go to heaven? In other words, if Jesus came right now, would he find the church ready or in problems? Severe problems. Because we're mainly lukewarm. Now, we're not talking about any specific church. We're talking, as a people, we're pretty comfortable. I mean, if you don't think we're okay, all you have to do is read the Adventist Review. You'll find that we're doing fine. I'm not against the Adventist Review. I love the Adventist Review. But it's all positive news. Where's the, where's the situation that something is wrong? You won't find it there. You see, our, our publications like to publish nice things. I don't blame them. But when you go to the doctor, you don't want to hear nice things. You want to hear reality. And the real situation is things are not always OK. In fact, our situation is fatal. And so the divine physician says, I have a fatal diagnosis for you. But I have treatment. That's the wonderful thing. The divine physician knows exactly what to do. And he offers us that. Now, our publications do a wonderful job in giving us the projects around the world, the things that are happening. This is really beautiful. I'm not saying it's their job to necessarily do that, but I'll tell you all, I know whose job it is. It's the pastor's job to give the trumpet a certain sound. If you came to a church and you were comfortable, the pastor is not doing his job. And of course, the official organ of the church should reflect that same thing too. It is not the administrators and pastors and shepherds' job to keep the sheep comfortable. That kills them. It is their job to present truth in such a way that the Holy Spirit makes you squirm and you see it and you say, something is wrong, I've got to change. The fatal churches, the ones that are killing the sheep, are those that preach nice messages. And so the chief shepherd is saying, you're about ready to be vomited. That's fatal. So do something about it. I'm selling... The solution, come to me, buy of me gold, eye ointment, and white raiment. Now, if you, I'm going to go on now to, why, why, to the second part of the message, which is the whole reason. Laodicea, you agree with me, cannot be saved in that state. Is that, is that true? Okay. Now, before Jesus comes, that means there won't be any more Laodicea, will there? After the vomiting process, there won't be any more lukewarm. The only thing that's left is hot. The cold are already out. So Laodicea has to die. Laodicea will disappear. It's, it has a death sentence. The divine shepherd will vomit out all the lukewarm. The only thing left will be those that accept the invitation to buy gold and eye ointment and white, and white raiment. God's, God's righteousness by faith. Now, what happens to those people if they're not laid to see anymore? Could there be another church? Eight churches? No. What can happen? Well, I was walking down in Venezuela, down at our school, and in the Gran Sabana, southeast part of Venezuela. By the way, what a lovely part of the world. That, that, you know, that's where Angel Falls is. We go by Angel Falls all the time. We see that beautiful thing. You know, 
When I used to live in a Caribbean, people say, oh, you live out where all the white beaches. And I say, I never noticed. When you live in a place, you kind of forget some of it. You, don't, you see it every day, you forget it, you know? But I fly by Angel Falls, and I take visitors there. Oh, what? You know, you, I, I start at the top with the airplane, and I do four turns from the top all the way to the bottom. And pretty, at the very last turn, we come by the bottom, and we fly only 20, 30 feet away from the falls, and we're looking right up at the falls, taking pictures. That is so beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the world. And I was down there, and one of the teachers said, Pastor Gates, I have a, a question for you. Who is the bride of Christ? I said, oh, it's the church, of course. Are you sure? Yeah. I said, yes, you do some more study. A challenge to study. Good excuse. And so I went back. And I started doing a little review, and I got on my computer, and I decided to type in bride. And that one of the first things I saw was Revelation 21. So I quickly looked it up. Revelation 21, verse 2. And John said, And John said, I, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's the word bride. New Jerusalem. What? God's going to marry a city? No, 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 no. It has to be a symbol. God is not going to marry a city. And he's going to marry people. So I said, I better keep looking. The key must be in the word New Jerusalem. Let me type in the word New Jerusalem. So I typed in New Jerusalem. And I hit on Revelation 3. So I went back to Revelation 3. And then I recognized the verse. You know, Revelation 3, 8, or 7 to 13, is about the church of Philadelphia. And if Philadelphia means what? Does brotherly love generally characterize the Seventh-day Adventist church? When people come to our church for the first time, do they go away saying, it was the most loving church I've ever been to? Is that what they say? No. <laughs> <laughs> it should, right? Yeah. That's not the way we're characterized. Oh, just in India? I didn't hear that. I was in South America? I don't hear it. In North America? I don't hear it. Some people actually, mistakenly, they say, I know the Seventh-day Adventist church is right, but I go to the other church because they're so loving. What an indictment. <laughs> indictment. You know? Um, we don't, we're not Philadelphia. Right now, Philadelphia does not describe the Seventh-day Adventist church as general. But I remembered verse 8. Read verse 8 with me just because, because it's something else happened that keyed me into this. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and not denied my name. I was in Brazil, one of the DVDs you got there, the um, Extreme Faith DVD, uh, is, is a, a, partly a story of, a, of a, an $18 million television network uh, contract in Brazil. You see, after God paid for Bolivia $1.5 million, I understood a little better that money is not even the issue. I've always known that, but until God does it, <laughs> you have this little, this little fear in your mind that maybe it's too big. But when God paid 1.5 million, my courage got up a little more. <laughs> and I said, maybe, maybe God can do something 10 times bigger. Just maybe God can do something 10 times bigger. And so when they called me to Brazil and they offered me a television network, they wanted, they wanted more than that, but we finally negotiated 18.5 million. Now, I didn't ask for it. In fact, I didn't want to go through the pain again. Come on, Lord. I just went through Bolivia. You finally paid for it. Again? I have to do it again? And he said, David, you were praying for Brazil, weren't you? Yes, Lord, but come on. 18 million? And so I went. I negotiated. And it was time to sign the final contract. And I got in the elevator. And I felt like I was going to a lamb as a lamb to a slaughter. Because I was going up 18 stories. At the very top, I was supposed to sign a document for 18.5 million, and I was standing there going, this is it, I'm dying. And as, I, as the door started to close, suddenly a hand reached in, and the doors opened up again, and some non-Adventist engineer said, oh, Pastor Gates, I forgot, a little paper for you, and handed me a little piece of paper. I said, thank you. And the doors closed again, and we started to go up, and I quickly read it, and all it said was, Revelation 3.8. So I quickly got my little PDA out, 
looked up Revelation 3.8, and lo and behold, I ran across this. He said, behold, I know thy works. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Oh, how encouraging. I'm getting ready to sign an $18.5 million contract. I don't have any money, but God gave me the opportunity. In fact, prophets and kings, prophets and, and prophets and kings, Sister White says, opportunities come from God. Success depends on how we utilize them. You think Satan would ever give God's people an opportunity to own a television network? If he had any chance, he'd keep us all in prison or kill us. He certainly would not give us an opportunity to buy a network. And so I knew this came from God. And I said, well, I'm not going to mess it up with my sin. I don't expect God to sign the paper. But he's sending me to do, to sign his name. You know, David, God, I can't do that. So David Gates, yeah, that's better. So I sign it, but, but I tell the people, I'm just signing for God. You know, he doesn't have a, he doesn't use a pen, he uses my pen. So, when, when I got this verse, it encouraged me significantly. And I said, but Lord, I don't have anything. And he says, keep reading. For thou hast only a little strength. I know you don't have very much, but at least you trust in me. You have kept my word and not denied my name. You believe I can do it, David. Oh, yes, I believe you can do it, Lord. You know I can do it. Yes, Lord, I know you will do it. Okay, then, I can trust you to sign the paper. So I went up. My courage was stronger. I signed that paper. And now I'm looking to see who the bride of Christ is. And... Uh, by the way, just a little quick update. I signed the paper. The man said, I need $8 million down payment. And I told him, you know, I don't have it right now, but I'll give it to you when I have it. <laughs> and guess what he said? Not a problem. I'm going to keep building my network and bigger and bigger and bigger. And whenever God gives you the money, you come paid. It's yours. I'm not selling it to anybody else. Amen. It's already been a year and two months. And I called him recently. I'm keeping my word, David. It doesn't belong to anybody else. That is your network. When God gives you the money, it is yours. Come get it. Why do, how does God do those kind of things? That's because when God asks you to do something, he has a plan already. All you have to do is just follow. I'm just following. I'm not going to pay for it. God is going to pay for it somehow. And the reason I'm telling you about it, by the way, is because I know none of you are going to give me $18 million Because otherwise you'd say, he was raising funds. I heard him ask for $18 million. Are any of you tempted to give me $18 million today? I don't think so, right? So you're not confusing this with fundraising. I mean, if you gave me $100, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help me pay the down payment. So I'm telling you, people tell me, ask me, why do you always tell those big stories? Because that way they can never confuse it with fundraising. If I told you a $10,000 story, you might be tempted to think I was asking. So I don't tell you those stories. I only tell God. But I don't mind telling you an $18 million story because for two reasons. One is you don't have it. Number two, when God does it, you know who did it. You can keep watching. And when it happens, you need to be aware of what God is doing, and it will encourage you to know there's no limits, absolutely none. Anything is possible. In fact, God's favorite question is, is anything too hard for God? Huh? That's God's favorite question. What's the answer? No. Okay. Anyway, let's, let's read now. Verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say is he that is true, he that has a key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth. I like that part. Every time I read my name David, I go, ah, yes. Of course, you can put your name there too. But I know he has my key because it says it. has a key of David. The solution for all my problems, he has them. And if he has my key, he has yours too. Now, of course, that's a very superficial. It can even go more and more and deeper in judgment, and you can have more in that verse. But... Just the slightest child can understand, if God is holding your key, he has the answer to all your problems. Just a straightforward reading is a beautiful solution to all your problems. Now, we read verse 8 already. Verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but they are not, but do lie. I will make them to come before you and worship before thy feet and know that I have loved you. Let me ask you a question. Is, it, is this spiritual Israel, or is this literal Jewish nation. I'm not hearing you. Spiritual. Spiritual. Okay. So let me read it. Let me read it differently. Okay. Now I realize we have a, a historical uh, view there, but, but God is always likes to put in multiple meanings. Let me read it just straightforward. Sometimes I like to get the straightforward meaning first, and then we can the other ones. Let me read it this way. 
Behold, I will make them which are the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Seventh-day Adventists, but they're not. They do lie. Did I apply? Is that, is that really what it means to? If it's spiritual Israel, we're talking about us. But that means something, in, something is happening here. You mean inside of spiritual Israel, there's people who say they are Seventh-day Adventists? They say they're true Christians? They say they're part of God's people, but they're lying? And the synagogue of Satan is well and healthy and well in our church? I'm sorry to say that that's true. That's what it says. I'm not interpreting it. I'm not, I'm just, I'm, all I'm saying is if it's spiritual Israel, then it means us. The synagogue of Satan is alive and doing well inside of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? Because in every church, you have the wheat and the tares. And there's three types of groups in the church. There's those that work for God. I always thought there was two groups. You know, all my life I grew up thinking there's two groups. Those that are, those that are hot and those that are lukewarm. That's really what I thought. And I've come, to, I've come to find out there are three groups. There's always three groups. When the Twin Trade Towers came down, Time Magazine said there was three groups. 15% knew exactly what they were doing, they got out. The moment the plane hit, they were going down the stairs. There's another 15%, they panicked. They just screamed and screamed and panicked and they never got anything, then they died. They just got in the way. And then it was about 70%. You know what happened to them? They didn't do anything, they froze. In every crisis, 70 to 80% of the people freeze. They don't do anything. In fact, one group even called a board meeting. Let's go to the board meeting and decide what we're going to do. And while they were in the board meeting, the whole building went down. And the church has three groups. Those that serve God, the vast majority don't do anything. I, don't, I wish I could take some statistics to find out how many people are really putting their money where their mouth is. You belong to this church? How involved are you in world missions? I, that's none of my business. But I mean, if I knew, I would, I would almost be willing to say that a very small percentage of you really are active in missions, putting your money where your mouth is. It's always that way. 70 to 80% sit on their rear end until they die. The bottom 10 to 15% work for the enemy. Every time God wants to move, they try to block it. They work for self. They work for themselves. Some of them specifically believe they work for God, but they always oppose it because they, they, their, their, their interests are first. And some actually work for the enemy, and they, they know it. But there's a small percent that are enemies. They're in there. I just throw that out so you will know. Not so you can go looking and saying, I think him, I think her. No. <laughs> Examine your life. Make sure you're not one of them. Make sure you're solidly committed to Jesus Christ and the mission no matter what it costs you. And then you're okay. So examine your life. Okay, let's go on. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which is coming upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. If today you learn to trust God and you begin a relationship of dependence, total dependence, Everything you have is on the altar. When he says give, you give. When he says mortgage, you mortgage. When he says go, and you go. When he says spend, you spend. When, when he says whatever, you do what he says. And you start depending. You see God come through for you. As you do that, you begin to learn that God is faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. He that is faithful, who has called you, is faithful, and he will do it. So, so God is trying to teach us that he is faithful, and he can take care of everything. When he asks you for something, he always follows through. And so if you learn that, the temptation that is coming upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. And it's going to try everybody. Nobody will escape except one group. Those that have already learned to trust God now. That's why he says, if you keep the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that is coming on all the world. What a wonderful, you know, my, my daughter just told me, Daddy, guess what? She's taking, she finished nursing and now she's taking dental hygiene. And, her, and while her husband finishes his master's degree, her husband uh, and um, nurse practitioner to go to Brazil. They're going to be working in Brazil later on this year, direct, heading up a medical launch, the Luzero program. And it was closed and we're reopening it. And, um, and she told me, I was told I don't have to take the final exam. They have taught me all they have to do is teach me. So the next semester I'm just going to do practicums because there's nothing for me to do. That's always nice when they tell you that, isn't it? You don't have to take the final exam. You're already ready. Well, that's what, that's what God is saying here. He says, if you learn a lesson now to learn to be patient and trust in me, I will keep you from that 
you, I, you will automatically pass the final exam without going to the exam. Yeah. It's a wonderful promise. Yeah. But if you don't, get ready now. We, what happens to people who don't study for their exam? You won't pass it. Behold, I come quickly, verse 11. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Here is the first hint that Jesus is saying he's coming back. Philadelphia, get ready. I'm coming during the Philadelphia experience. It is my belief that Laodicea, after the vomiting experience, will back up and become Philadelphia all over again. They were Philadelphia before, the early Advent movement. We're going to return to the early Advent movement. It'll become the late Advent movement. All of a sudden, the bridegroom is coming. Go ye forth to meet him. Everybody's going to put everything online. That's the cry that should go out right now. Everybody needs to know now. If you do that, and after God cleans house, there will be nobody left except Philadelphians. Amen. And when people come to this church, and all, those, and all those 250 congregations in India start coming in, and others, guess what's going to happen? They're going to say, have you heard? The Seventh-day Adventist church is the most loving church out there. When you go there, you can tell the Holy Spirit's present. You can go, you go there right now, they have the truth, and it, the seal of God is upon them. But, a little bit longer. So behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take your crown. The devil is trying to snatch your crown out from under you. Don't let go. Hang on there. Stay with God. Memorize. Learn. Put your roots in deep. Trust God. Take any risk you have to. But hang on to your crown because somebody else is about to get it from you. And finally, verse 12. And when I read verse 12, all of a sudden, it shook me as I realized. Read it with me. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar? You think that's literal? Are you going to be turned? You think those that overcome will be turned into a marble pillar? Maybe even a transparent gold? You, do, do you want to be a transparent gold pillar in heaven? What does it mean? Is it, is it literal pillar? No. A permanent fixture in the temple of my God. Okay? You will be there. You will be, you, you'll be part of the temple. You will permanently live there. And it says, in fact, it's, in fact, it continues. It says, he shall go in and out no more. Go out no more. It means, once, once you, those who overcome are going to live in the temple of God. They're going to be permanent fixtures. It's going to be their home. They're going to live there. They will never have to say goodbye again. You know, I don't know in California how it is. I know there's a little bit of everything, but I just recently performed a wedding in, in Romania. And after the wedding, they didn't, the, the, the couple didn't invite me on the honeymoon. <laughs> How do, do they do that here the same in California? <laughs> you know, I think it's all around the world the same thing. The bride lives in the house, but even the pastor and even all the wedding guests, they have to say goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow. But the bride never has to say goodbye. She lives there. That's the home. And the same thing God is saying here too. He's saying, if those that overcome in this Philadelphia experience... They will live in a temple permanently. They will never have to say goodbye again. And then suddenly, you start beginning to get a hint of who they are. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which ascends out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And I started thinking, which group in Revelation actually has the name of God written on their foreheads? And I, and I found the answer in Revelation 14. Right on the first verse. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood upon a Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I begin to see something. The living church, when Jesus comes, the 144,000 have the seal of God on their forehead, and they overcome, and they live in his temple. So I decided to go to the Spirit of Prophecy, and I started looking through early writings. I wonder what God, the Spirit of Prophecy has to say on this. And the first thing I found was, just around verse 12 to 15, in chapter, I mean, in pages 12 to 15, she's walking to the, to the new earth, and all of a sudden they come to the temple, and Jesus raises his lovely voice and says, only the 144,000 may enter this place. Interesting. That fits. Only the 144,000 enter the temple, and here it says they live there. And then I began to read some more, and Sister White said something interesting. Only once. She said, many are invited to the banquet of the Lamb. But if you're invited, you are not the bride. 
You can't be the bride and be invited because it's the bride who does the invi invitation. You understand? So those that are invited, the great multitude that are invited, they rejoice with the lamb and his bride. But that doesn't make them the bride because they're invited guests. If you're a guest, you cannot be the bride. Very interesting. And then on another place in early writings, a tablet was held up before with 50 verses. And you read down to the verses, in, the several, in several places there's a direct link between following the Lamb all the way and Revelation 3.12. Right next, side by side. And I begin to understand a little better. God is preparing a beautiful people. I read something else too. Jesus is in the most holy place and he's ministering and suddenly everybody, has their decisions have been made. He steps aside and he says, I'll be right back. And Sister White says he goes to receive the kingdom from his father. And there, the wedding is performed. You see, the father is going to perform a wedding one of these days. And he says he marries the New Jerusalem. And who is this New Jerusalem? Those that have the name New Jerusalem on their forehead. And who are these people? The 144,000. It's very clear, even though we haven't necessarily brought it up, but it's very clear. God will have a people. It'll have God the Father, the New Jerusalem, and the Son's new name. And Jesus finishes his work as our high priest. He steps aside. He puts on the garments of a king. There is a wedding service. The father declares him married to his bride, and he says, go down, son, and get your bride. And while you're at it, bring all the invited guests too. What a wonderful day. It's in our generation, by the way. This is the last generation. I tell people, there's only a matter of months. If I say years, you've heard that before, haven't you? Jesus will come one of these years. So they say, I'll plan in about 20 years. Sorry. When I hear statistics that are published like, in 20 years, the Seventh-day Adventist Church will have 50 million members. I cry. Number one, in 20 years, the world will have grown by 2 billion more. And 50 million is an absolute pittance. Secondly, when we publish statistics like that, our church members say, in 20 years, well, I'll just relax. I'll have 20 more years to carry on my business. In year 19, I'll start getting serious. We don't have 20 years. We don't have 10 years. The great crisis from all evidences that we have is about to break upon the world in the next two to three or four years. All the evidences point that if God wants to buy a little more time, he can buy a little more time. We know God can do that. We're not setting a date, but we have to know the signs of the times. And the signs of the times point to very, very f f in a, in shortly, two to five years, something drastic is about to happen. And if you want to discuss it in private with me, just the financial, only the finances of North America point to us that this country is about to enter the greatest collapse ever this country has ever experienced in the next few years. If there's ever a time to work for God, it's right now. Spiritually, the same thing point the same direction. The natural disasters, the same direction. Everything is coming to a, a, a converging to an explosive combination in our generation. And so we're off a few years. It's still a matter of months. And that, that great crisis will bring in soon after Jesus' second coming. And so here we are, just months away from the great crisis. It's the best news I've ever heard. This is not frightening news. It's the best thing that ever happened. We are the lucky generation. We get to see it happen. It is, a, it is a time when God's Holy Spirit will be so poured out. It has never been poured out before like that. But it's also one of the darkest periods of earth's history because the devil has never had so control of so many before either. And there's this great polarization taking place. Satan is taking total control of his people, and God is taking control of his. And there's no time to play the middle game. Get off the fence. Make your choice of whom you serve. And if you do it, do it with all your heart because you won't have time to make another one. Today, some of you will make your final choice. You, you choose to postpone today. For some of you, that will be your last choice because from there on, it only goes downhill. Some of you will make your positive choice today and follow the Lord all the way. Some of you may choose to reject, but we're not playing games anymore. This is your life. You have to make choices. Not making a choice is a choice. And God is asking us to partner with him in his beautiful, last, great effort to prepare the world. He's preparing his bride right now. 
Boy, I know when I, I look back 26 years, some of you that have 70, 80 years old, do you remember your wedding day? It seemed like it would never come. What a wonderful thing it is, marriage. You know, we don't understand, but can you imagine what it's going to be like to be married to the Lamb? And 14, verse 5 says, and they follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. Someday, a million years from now, when Jesus goes to a planet, everybody will be ready. There He comes. The heavens open, and He comes down to that planet, and guess who's with Him? His bride. Throughout eternity, the 144,000 will follow Jesus everywhere He goes because they live with Him. And they'll never be separated again. So God is asking us today, do you want to be part of that? It's a love relationship. That's what it's all about. Not everybody can be married. You can be a guest. But he invites you to be the bride. You have the opportunity to be the bride. You can make that decision. And today, this weekend, has been a culmination of that. And so God is saying to you, I want to seal you. I want to put my character in you. I want to put my name on you. When I married my wife, she took my father's name, Gates. And the same thing will happen with Jesus, to take his father's name and his name forever. It's a beautiful invitation. I hope that somehow the Holy Spirit has just so convicted you this weekend that you can see that invitation and you can say, Lord, with all my heart, whatever it takes, I'm willing. Here am I. Send me. That's the invitation today. And I would, I would like to extend it to you. Just It's God who's extending it to you. But I have the opportunity to, to verbalize it so that you can make that choice. I made that choice. I want to be standing in that last day, very soon, in a few short months, when a crisis hits, I want to be part of God's special team, prepared to take the message all over the world, have his anointing, and everybody will know you belong to God. That's the invitation, and I offer it to you. I pray that you will have made the same decision. God bless you.